So I, um, I feel compelled to um, um, uh, address some of the issues that people have already raised in terms of, uh, in particular, uh, yes, it's true, Kathy, you can't leave COLA. You'll notice that I, I continue to keep my COLA affiliation, which is true. Uh, you can't leave COLA, and it's a good thing. Um, too bad Lou, Lou left because um, uh, I would like to make, you know, I, I want to thank him for this plug for NMME. Uh, it's not national, it's North American. We have Canadian partners, just so you know. That's important to us, to our Canadian partners in particular. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, Jennifer, um, I have to confess I've stolen something from you and I use it all the time, so it's flattery. I get up and I give NMME talks and I say, I say NMME really fast and I apologize. It sounds like I'm saying enemy. I don't mean that. It's really my friend. I love it. I got that from Jennifer Adams, so here I'm publicly confessing I got that from you. By the way, someone else has stolen it from me. It's propagated. It's out there in the ether. Dennis, happy birthday. Thank you very much for be your willingness to send your long form birth certificate so we can verify. Shukla, come on. So I was going to wish you a happy birthday, but trust but verify. OK, by the way, the, the, the Thai Shukla, it really is just for you. As soon as I'm done, it's out of here. OK. Anything else I need to mention? Oh, yes, one last thing. Uh, uh, it's not a cola event in my mind if I don't say something mean to Jim. That's, that's just the way it works. And so I'm sure I have the coveted spot just before the break, between, be, be, you know, between you and your break, and I'm sure Jim did that to me. So I would just like to thank you, Jim, from the bottom of my heart for that. <laughs> so, uh, I should start where my, so, by the way, I'm, I'm really bothered by this, the fact that neither Boa, who you saw just a few moments ago, nor Paul seems to suffer the same fate that I am, regards to hair. Uh, and anyways, uh, you know, that was Shukla's uh, vision, it, it probes, cops, copes, something along those lines we started out. Just a little bit of uh, brief historical perspective. When I was a graduate student, Shukla taught this course in long range uh, uh, weather forecasting, and he asked me to look at uh, some papers in this, this particular book in 84. And uh, Tim, I think it was Tim Del Sol showed some results from the first paper uh, that was actually published in Jazz. What really, was really interesting to me at the time is um, the second paper, which is really a big part of this whole conversation we're having today, that paper at the time, Shukla was unable to get published. That's the boundary forcing paper. That's the paper that's had so, such a profound influence on the field. And that was the paper that was difficult to publish. I thought that was just a really interesting I fact. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, the field has exploded. There was the DFS, DSP provost project, uh, projects, and DERF was before that, and, and ensembles, and, and all these other things. And, and, then, and then there was this notion of copes, and I have to, I have to you know, Shukla must know this, that you know, all his students across the generations, we all have Shukla stories. And there, there's a certain amount of embellishment that goes on among us former students, but this one, you know, maybe the details are a little off, but the, the, the gist of the story is true. We're off to Moscow, and Shukla and Tim decide they're going to stay at some, some Russian Academy of Sciences hostel. And this, and this place was, you know, uh, as the picture shows. And, and, and I, I asked one of our graduate students where I should stay. He happened to be from Moscow, and he, he pointed out, well, you should stay at this five-star hotel. And, Every morning, I would tell Shukla about the lovely omelet I had at the omelet bar. And by the third or fourth morning, I could see little bits of smoke coming out of his ears. <laughs> Not too happy with me. OK. So and it was at this, uh, so it was Cope, Cops, Probe, those were all rejected. But Cope's, Cope's was endorsed at this JSC meeting in Moscow. And um, 
uh, that was in 2004, I believe. And then uh, in 2007 was sort of the, the culmination from my perspective, the seasonal prediction perspective, this Barcelona meeting. And uh, some of these quotes, Shukla, actually, you know, because when you, you say things now, they, they get recorded. So this is taken directly from one of your slides. Um, uh, these things do get recorded. And uh, I, think, I think it's true today. The, uh, uh, our progress is limited by uh, improvement of models and our ability to assimilate observations and improved observations. So I think that uh, shows, he said this in 2007 and I still think it's true today. Um, and just one, one result, you know, uh, this is a picture from the, uh, uh, the CHFP, which is the Climate Historical Forecast Project across a number of different models trying to uh, predict Nino 3-4 temperatures. And I think the, 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 uh, the takeaway message is that things have gotten a lot better, but there's still a long way to go. And again, that, that uh, ensemble of opportunity, as Jim, Jim would call it, is tough to beat. That's the, the green bar that tends to stand out above all the other bars. And at some point, at some point in time, uh, I think it's agreed, Kathy's right, we do need to do ensembles. We need to do ensembles that probe uncertainty in models, but we have to get beyond this notion of a, a model of opportunity somehow. Uh, and then, of course, that brings me to enemy, said quickly. Uh, that particular quote, Shukla, I actually can't, I could try it very, very hard, because I do remember you telling me one time, um, in fact, several times, uh, we have to do real prediction. In fact, you convinced me when we developed our first coupled model that we should do it in real time. And uh, you endorsed publishing the extended long range forecast bullets and all because you felt that researchers could gain a lot by being engaged in real prediction. So I couldn't get the right quote because I, I couldn't find it anywhere out there. But uh, I do want to show you some results uh, from the NMME project, um, which is near and dear to my heart. And, by the way, is a, is a, even though Lou forgot to mention, he mentioned NASA, he mentioned NCAR, he mentioned GFDL as part of NMME, he forgot COLA. And so, as you can see, many of the authors of the NMME paper are, in fact, COLA people. Um, so, my, uh, uh, other than sort of uh, taking the reins of the project, my, my, my other responsibility is really using the um, NCAR family of models to do the seasonal predictions. And so I want to show you some results from those NCAR family of models. But there's a purpose in me showing you this slide. One of the things that's really interesting about the NMME project, because we're involving uh, different research models that, that uh, have different development cycles, the system itself, even though it's only been out since August of 2011, has gone through about four updates. So it's constantly evolving, constantly improving. And I think, you know, on the one hand, you could say, oh, well, it's a constantly evolving thing. That's a bad thing. But on the other hand, it's a constantly evolving thing. It's constantly getting better. And uh, hopefully there'll be even more improvements. So one of the charges that Jukal always used to say to me all the time is uh, the models are terrible. They're just terrible. He, he, sometimes he would refuse to say that in public, but then later he, he got more vocal about saying that in public. He said, we have to say that publicly. The models are terrible. And, and I, you know, NCAR, uh, our NCAR colleagues really have met that challenge of trying to improve, improve their model in a great way as other modeling centers have. But here you have some real clear, clear results of how the uh, NCAR model has, in, has improved. What I'm showing you here is um, uh, Equatorial Pacific, and the top two panels is Equatorial Pacific sea surface temperatures from the forecasts. So these are initialized forecasts. These are not long runs. Uh, and they're at various lead times. So uh, CCSM3 on the, on the left and CCSM4 on the right, and, and the observations are shown. And so you can see the, the, the tremendous amount of work that NCAR put into improving the tropical Pacific bias is, is, is even holding in the forecast mode across lead times. And so I think, I think they really deserve a pat on the back for that. That was a tremendous amount of work and a big benefit. And then this is, the bottom two panels are looking at just the evolution, the time evolution of Nino 3-4 temperatures. And so you can see at zero lead or the initial condition, things line up fairly well across models. They should, if they didn't, we're in a lot of trouble. 
But when you go to the longer lead, six month lead, the CCSM4 is hanging on to that pretty well. So I really think that, you know, uh, uh, we're making progress in Shukla's vision. We're, not, we're certainly not there yet, and we certainly have a long way to go. But there are some things that we can really point to that are improving. Uh, uh, better models and better initial conditions. Uh, and I think both points are, are really valid. This is, this is looking at the rank probability skill score uh, from uh, CCSM3 and CCSM4, looking at January and June initial conditions, just one season lead, so it's a relatively low bar. But what you notice immediately, uh, I should say that um, the red colors are good, blue colors are bad. What you notice immediately is that the CCSM4 reduces the amount of blue, that's terrific but it also increases the areas that are red. We've been doing pretty well in the deep tropical Pacific, pretty well in the deep tropical Pacific. So what's really happening with CCSM4 is we're getting additional regions that are turning red. And we can even quantify how much of that is due to improved initial conditions and how much is due to improved models, and of course it's a mix. One of the things that, the other things that, that you know, Shukla, is, uh, and Kohler are famous for is that's the importance of land surface initial conditions in any prediction problem. And fortunately, uh, when we started out with the CCSM3 uh, forecast, we didn't initialize the land. And so uh, we set a very low bar, which was really good for me, because when we do initialize, what you can see, this is again that, that ranked probability skill score for two meter temperature, uh, just verifying in the first month of this case, uh, uh, CCSM3 on top and CCSM4 on the bottom, and again, um, a significant reduction of the blue colors and a lot more red colors indicating a, a significant improvement. And, and here, we really do think the bulk of that is due to initial conditions because we've tested the same thing in CCSM3. Uh, Dan Paulino did a lot of that work and found that you get a similar improvement. So it's really the initial condition that's giving, giving us that improvement there. So uh, one of the most important things, of course, is uh, improving reliability. That's one of the reasons why we uh, use these multi-model ensembles, again, of opportunity. There, there's a long way to go there. But uh, what we're looking at here is um, three different sets of reliability curves. And so this is northern hemisphere, two meter temperature over land. And uh, this is all lead times being shown here. And so the first one on the far left that's the CFS reliability curve. Okay, so red is the upper tercile, uh, blue is the uh, lower tercile, and the brown that looks washed out, that's near normal. The uh, top uh, right panel that says mini NMME, and so this is an important thing. This is a, a sample, a subsample of the NMME models that have exactly the same ensemble size as the CFS ensemble. So really the question I'm asking you here is how much of the reliability that we're seeing in the grand NMME is due to ensemble size because CFS has on the order of 24, the NMME has on, or, on the order of 100. So how much of that improvement is ensemble size and how much is due to uh, model diversity, if you will. And so you can argue about it, but it looks like a significant fraction of the fact that those, those reliability curves are more along the diagonal is due to model diversity, and a non-trivial fraction is due to increased ensemble size. And we can, we can drill down a little, uh, even a little bit more on this question of is it model diversity or uh, ensemble size with the NMME system. And so I just want you to look at the one of uh, the column in this table that's uh, circled in black here, just as an example. And so what this is showing you is that above, above normal and below normal tercile forecasts, the Breyer skill score for those forecasts for the uh, upper uh, row is CFS, 24 members, the mini NMME, and of course the full NMME. And so when you look at the top table, that's northern hemisphere land points, uh, uh, what you notice is that maybe on the order of half of the improvement in the Breyer skill score comes from uh, the model diversity, two minutes, and half comes from uh, 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 the ensemble size. For Nino 3.4, for example, it's all due to model diversity. So I need to skip ahead quickly 
here, uh, too much kibitzing. Uh, Shukla has charged us with another revolution. Again, you can tell Shukla I stole this slide from you somewhere on the web, it's out there. Uh, uh, I picked it in particular because it said 2015. So this was a revolution, you told us it was gonna be here by 2015, but, <laughs> but <laughs> he's not that far off is my point. The revolution's not that far off. Of course, there was the Athena project. Uh, Tim and, and uh, Jim led the Athena project. There's also uh, this uh, uh, project that Jim and I were involved with looking at uh, ocean resolution. And uh, of course, I'm biased. I really like this ocean resolution one. So I want to show you a couple pictures from an IPCC class model. This is a sea surface temperature structure in the North Atlantic from a uh, IPCC class model versus AVHRR high resolution data. And then you can see what happens when you actually uh, use, this is a coupled model, this is a, a very high resolution version of C CCSM, 10th of a degree ocean. And this is what happens when you use that 10th of a degree ocean. Uh, this is based on a 100 year average. And um, one of the important results um, from this uh, simulation is if you look at the rainfall, the bottom panel here is the observed estimate of rainfall. The gray that you can't see at all, the gray contours that you probably can't see, that's the low resolution model. And the colors, again, are the high resolution model. So you can see the rainfall is sitting right on the SST front in the high resolution model because you have a Gulf Stream, whereas the low resolution model you basically don't, and so it doesn't sit on the front. And um, this leads to uh, really interesting low frequency variability in the model. So I just want you to look at just the panel on the left, on your left there, uh, and look at the black curve and the purple curve. That is the power spectra of the uh, latitude, uh, the longitude, the latitudinal position of the 200 millibar jet. So the atmospheric component model is identically the same here. So this is only, this is an atmospheric response to the fact that there's a Gulf Stream in the right place. We have these low frequency excursions in a, where the jet would like to be preferentially sit that happens in this high resolution model that just does not happen in the low resolution model. And you can see why this is what that coupled mode looks like. Uh, this is the uh, heat content, the, yeah, heat content anomalies. So you have, you have a, a coupled mode that's happening in this high resolution model that's associated with the SST front, that's the black contour, that just doesn't happen in the low resolution model. You can't find this picture in that low resolution model. Um, the last, this is my last slide, promise. So, uh, last bubble of, from Shukla 2. The, you know, one of the things that I, you know, people have alluded to that um, uh, Shukla has done, and, and that is he's, he's, he's really uh, fostered careers. So, I, 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 you know, I just honestly can say that I wouldn't be where I am today if I am anywhere. I wouldn't be, where I am, where I am today, if it weren't if it weren't for Shukla, I came to his office one day, and many times I came to his office. I came to his office with idea with this crazy idea, this interactive ensemble thing, and I said, Shukla, I need every single computer Cola has for the next few years, and he said, Sure, no problem, <laughs> let's do it, let's take a risk, and that, and I think that's the way Shukla thinks. He really he, he's really the, willing to take a risk on somebody. He's really willing to take risks that Ed has talked about in terms of setting up COLA and coming back to GMU, and this is much, much appreciated. And just like all the people he supported, this has turned into this tremendous cottage industry with tons of papers. Thank you, Ben. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, hi, uh, Kim. Uh, Bao Hua uh, has sh shown different uh, ocean initialization um, could uh, ensemble, multiple ensemble of initialization also could improve the forecast skill. You suggest uh, different models improve the skill. How do you view these two views, uh, two versions of the, which one we should uh, approach more? I think we should approach both. I think both will be fruitful. I think Bowa's results are very convincing. Ben, I wonder if you could speak a bit about NMME and what is or is not done in terms of initializing the land surface and maybe what could be done to help improve the forecast further since you're showing two meter temperature over land, for instance. 
Um, I'm not sure I got it all. What could be done better? Is that what you're saying? Oh, well, what, what is being done now? This is a trap question. Uh, yeah. And then what can be done further? So with um, the CCSM4 that we're that the runs that we're doing, we take CFSR data and uh, cram it into uh, CCSM4. Uh, so I'm sure if we started to look at that a little bit more carefully other than just forcing it in, uh, we could make a lot of improvements. And when we start thinking about the sub-seasonal problem, I think we're gonna need to think about that more carefully and, and also for the atmosphere. Uh, so I'm sure we could do a whole lot better with CCSM4. With the uh, GFDL floor data, there is no land initialization, and, but they have recognized um, based on some experiments that they really need to do that. So they're starting to do that. So there's a lot, there's a lot of things that, can, that are being done and can be done that are uh, better.